statement of who you are? Um, hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I was your age, I was studying particle physics. I did an undergraduate, I got a PhD in particle physics. Um, I was interested in big questions, like cosmology and big thing. This is your uh, I was interested in the big questions like cosmology and big thing. Um, I completed a PhD at Johns Hopkins from theoretical physics in 92, and from there I went to Wall Street, where I worked as a bond trader for 20 years at Solomon Brothers, and you know the book, the book uh, Liar's Poker. That was where I was, or if you um, see the movie The Big Short, that's a fairly fair, accurate portrait of, of what I did. Um, in 2008, I got kind of tired of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I started basically spending more time. All my life I've gone on long, long walks, immensely long walks to, to kind of uh, to clear my head, 20 mile walks, things like that. I started making those walks more, more, more part of my life, and so I'm spending less time on trading, more time walking. And along those walks, I started talking to people. I then started taking pictures of them. I started, started writing the stories. And then by 2012, I was, uh, I quit Wall Street, um, but they quit me. Um, and I was, I spent three, three to four years in Hunts Point. If you know New York City, Hunts Point is basically, well, statistically the worst neighborhood. Um, spending time with a street family, let's say maybe 60 people who were homeless addicts, heroin addicts, um, documenting their stories. Um, and uh, I then took that process on the road, drove uh, roughly, um, put roughly 400,000 miles in my car driving around the United States doing the same sort of thing, going to the neighborhoods they told me not to go to, Gary, Indiana, Calvert, uh, South of Chicago, uh, basically just walking and talking to people. The result of that was a book called Dignity. Um, that was 2017. I only got the book deal because I suggested that Trump might win. And uh, people called me crazy at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, since 2020, I have instead shifted to going around the world. I have a, uh, a thing called walking around the world, where I literally go to places and walk around the world. So I, I arrived two days ago from Japan, where for poetic um, license, I'll say, I, I literally walked across Japan. Um, I did it two separate trips, but I never did walk across Japan. Um, before that, I was in Mongolia, where I spent a lot of time in Ulan Bator, walking into the neighborhoods that people like to go to Ulan Bator, the Air District. Um, and then prior to that, I was in Korea, um, where I did before exploring the so, if you're Korean, you know what an LP bar is. Um, that's what it was. And before that, I had a simple post of different places. So that's kind of what I am. Is that a fair summary? Great. So we have these two concepts, travel and tourism. Why do we have these two different concepts? Why do we have these two different words? Um, I think what most people know No. Okay. Um, but go on. No, no, no. But I, there, I see there is kind of two ways of visiting the place. There is the you go to Yelp, you look at the top five things you're supposed to do, and you do them. You go, you, know, you might have watched Anthony Bourdain, or you might have watched the um, Bizarre Beats, and you go, I got to go to these five restaurants. Um, if you go to Istanbul, you go to the Hagia Sophia. Um, you might go to Besitakis in the neighborhood, but you certainly don't go to Ustadara. You certainly don't go to the Asia side and go up to the hills where the, you know, the, 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 where that is more highly Muslim. Um, you might go to Category. You, you kind of do these checklists of places. What I, what I call, the pieces I call thin travel. It's just very much, you go to a place and you just kind of do what you're supposed to do to say, hey, I, I'm taking in what it is to be in this level. Thin travel is what I prefer. It is, you don't go to high Sophia. 
if you go to the Hyatt Sophia, do it at Sunday morning at 6 and you check it off because all the Hyatt and bus tour buses are there and they're really experienced. Instead, you go to the big mosque and the Asian side of the theater built by Erdogan that everybody says not to go to, but it's filled with tourists, but Muslim tourists in the other parts of Istanbul. I'm from of Turkey, and I come from Yemen, and I come from Jordan. Um, it's a place that actually still is a, a functioning uh, mosque. It's kind of where the Normans go, <laughs> and it's not a tourist attraction. So that, to me, is kind of how I try to travel. I don't know if that's in your world. So, I mean, even, is it fair to say that the thin travel or tourism is an imitation of the thick travel? Yeah, I mean, it's not, see, I don't have any problems with product. It's just not what I do. Um, I think that it gives you, in many ways, I don't know what you know, in your generation goes at top center, what at top center is. Um, in many ways, it's a lot like just going to that top center. You're cosplaying to be Turkish. You're cosplaying to be Mongol. You're cosplaying to be Japanese. Or the people around you are doing that. They're presenting this culture to you for the tourists to feel like, hey, I had this experience of being in Japan. I had this experience of being in the as opposed to actually trying to go up the next layer down and ask yourself, how do Mongolians see the world? How do the Japanese see the world? How do the Turkish see the world? Because you know, how you dress, how you eat is one thing, one part of culture. And that's a very thin part of culture. It's a very obvious part of culture. It's a difference. But how you think about yourself in the world is also a part of culture. And that's kind of what you know, that's kind of what I like to try to get at. You know, how does a Turk, okay, how does a guy, working class guy, in Ustadar, Istanbul, view his place in the universe? Or a woman, how does she feel why she's here on Earth? If she even thinks about it. Um, and so that's kind of what I try to do with travel is, and what I call fit travel, is trying to understand how people make sense of the universe and whatever. Do you think it's just a matter of degree? Because um, you might think, well, spend like, you know, a week or two weeks in a city where maybe you don't even speak the language, and um, and what you're getting is maybe less of a performance than what you would be getting in the central tourist district. But you're uh, you're getting people who are showing you their hospitality. They're showing you how they interact with court. That, so that's what you're going to see. And that's still only the skin or the surface of their culture or how they live, which presumably to really know that you have to live with them. I think I think the, the, you can act fit cult, you can act fit travel, mm -hmm. um, you can do it right, but it still requires time. And you have to spend time. Um, and one of the things I will say kind of like, this might not be the audience for it, but even if if you go to a, one of the things I learned in the US, and I travel in the US, and I learned certainly in travel in the law, in school, if you go to, let's say, Mongolian, and you go talk to the professors of the Mongolian history, they themselves might not have ever been to the Garibus. There is a bubble of elite in every country, and they're generally academics, and they generally don't interact a lot with the rest of the country. So the Garibus district, which is um, they call it the because it's basically traditional tents in the southern hills. Um, it's where 60% of the people who live in the Tartar um, occupies most of the space in the city. But you can find people who have grown up in the Tartar who are wealthy, who've never been there. <laughs> you know, they, they, they view it only as this distant problem, and that's some sense that it says, I think, a lot of the problem staying in these certain districts. Like, you know, I, there is always one district every town, which is where the wealthy live. And it's, it, it is, in many ways, just a variation of the This is the same culture. Like, you know, the, the upscale neighborhood moved the rest. It's almost exactly the same as the upscale neighborhood in Lima, you know, it's almost exactly the same as the other. They have their sex acts to that. Same thing when you go to the Carlo, the upscale neighborhood is very much just a, you know, it's almost what I call, um, it's almost like a, they, they play act being Indonesian, having different festive flags. But in, in many ways, they're very much Western, very global. 
And I think the important thing is, is there, so time is certainly very important, but getting out of these neighborhoods, getting into different neighborhoods is, is essential. So one of the things you say that really moved you as you were leaving the world of investment banking uh, into the world of walking um, is that you, um, you know, you felt that you'd been sort of clueless. You lived a cloistered life, and you were clueless about oh, how people lived, and your world was like narrow, uh, and uh, you you didn't. You didn't have this access, this bigger access to how other people live. And something I wonder about is just isn't that just true of everyone everywhere around the world? That we're all in some bubble or other. Um, and, and very few people have a good understanding of how most people live because most people are just like very far away from you, no matter where you are. Um, so doesn't like doesn't everyone live in a bubble? In a certain sense, like don't the people in that district in Mongolia Definitely. who maybe never went to the wealthy part of town, they live in a bubble too. Right? Definitely. But I feel like the onus is on us. We're weirdos, okay? Uh, me, you, um, too many people here, I call us the front row. We're the academics. Okay. We're weirdos. We're like and I love you all and I love me and I love her, but we're we're not normal. The idea of spending your time thinking about philosophical questions about why we're here. The idea of speaking about how should we run a country. That's just not what most people do. Um, and because of that, we basically, in many ways, we create policy. We run the countries, that we run Mongolia, the, the versions of us run Mongolia, the versions of us run Japan, the versions of us run Germany. And I think there's a consequently an obligation on us if we want to do this right. Mm -hmm to consequently know what other people think. You know, the politically disenfranchised might be doing that by choice. I mean, you can argue ethically, well, you know, they therefore should suffer the consequences. I don't happen to agree with that, but I feel like we need to be educated to be whatever you want to call us have an obligation that we're going to basically, we're, we're basically built, we're basically in our, in our jobs, in our policy, playing real life versions of similar simulation. And it's a, it's should be our obligation, consequently, to know what, what the consequences of those actions are. So, for instance, when I went out from 16 to the rest of the country, you know, I um, I was pretty much your class B or you know, wealthy Wall Street, um, Berkeley Heights Bay. I thought myself pretty pretty open minded. I had all my views, I had my papers, and, but when I got out and actually started talking to people. I had to fight the urge when they said something I disagreed with to say, well, actually, well, actually, you know, I know better than you. And it took about a year or two to actually step stop to you know, maybe I should listen. Maybe they put it in a, um, into a kind of utilitarian terms. Maybe I have utilitarian, maybe I have a, I have a, a framework, a utility function for life that they don't share. And consequently, the policy I believe is right not necessarily the policy that is actually delivering results they, they want, or is best for them in their own Right, so, I mean, one thing you, you talk about is that, like, in some of these poor neighborhoods um, that you would go to, there would be forms of um, public services that were available, but people would go to McDonald's instead. That they preferred to go to McDonald's, and that when they went into these uh, other organizations, they would get lectured at. Um, they would, the, the nonprofits would come with like rules of behavior and um, with judgment and we have to hear, so you tell me, people tell me what to do. And so it struck me as kind of an interesting puzzle, right? So you have people who are suffering, who are poor, and then you have other people who are running these nonprofits who want to help them, but the, the suffering poor people don't want to go to these uh, places because they get judged and they're saying what to do. And you know, your response was, well, instead of telling them what to do, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to listen, right? <coughs> Which, but but the, the realization you had is that you really couldn't do anything. That is, that you know, you um, uh, uh, you you say uh, to Keisha and her friends didn't need me trying to save them. Something I found myself explicitly and implicitly trying to do. They can handle themselves. They have 30 years on their street. So there's this problem about like 
how help can be anything other than condescension. Because um, listening might be good, but in and of itself, it's not. Well, what can be is uh, to get kind of provocative. I would say that kind of meaning. Mm. In the U.S., when we talk about the U.S., it's less true than the rest of the world. At a meaning level, at a true philosophical concept of how people view themselves. We have a very, we, front row, have like, we basically have careers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? We have, we have one form of, the way I think about it is um, how, you, how do you want to be remembered when you die? What do you put every time you In general, you know, I was a professor in the emeritus of you're going to emphasize your career. What I look, what I see is outside of the academic circle, outside of the public sector, what I call the um, they have what I call it, we're divided by meaning because what, their sense of who they are, in the universe, their sense of what's important, is what I call non credential forms of meaning. Things that you're gifted at birth, family, place, faith, and you know, controversially race. Those are things that, that give you. You don't, have, you don't have to have a resume to have those. You can, you know, they have free access. They're, they're very traditional forms, what I call, I have this framework I call the address, of, your address of the universe of meaning. They know who they are. They're, they're a welder from Kentucky who is from this, this family, um, and uh, they're, you know, they're, they're backers. Or they're, you know, they're, they're from the south side of Chicago, you know, and they come from this extended family. Their, their, their people are from, from, um, from Yazoo City, Mississippi, and that's who they are. And those things are those things give them a sense of place. They give, give them a sense of, of grounding in the universe. And we, we through policy, I don't know, have eroded those senses, those senses of meaning. We made it very, very hard for people to build an identity through a traditional form. So here's a good question. So you, so you yeah. can. So, so, so listening matters. But one of the things I, the, the lesson I learned from listening is that we are divided at a very fundamental level. And you know, you can take what you can use that information to do what you want. You can simply say, okay, well that's mm -hmm. outdated. We should just get rid of that. Or you can look at the opioid addictions and the, the, the suicides that are that are being caused by the sense of you know, why do people commit suicide? They commit suicide because they don't know who they are. They don't, they don't understand their place in the universe. So, like a, a kind of question that kept coming to me as I was reading through your blog post from the past like, year and a half is that there's almost a level on which you seem to kind of envy some of the people that are parts of these thick cultures and communities. Um, and like, like there's language you use where you talk about people who do real work as opposed to writing and photography, <laughs> the work that you do, right? So these are real people who do real work. There's uh, something that comes through in, in some of your writings on like Indonesia and Jordan is a real love of Islam and uh, respect for these Muslim communities and the ways in which they promote certain values in their communities. And you, you talk about how much you should respect religions, of course, for good, but like with all this like real work and this valuable religion, you're not that tempted to just it doesn't seem, or maybe I'm wrong, correct me. You're tempted to join it. Like to, to you say, well the religion isn't for you. Um, and maybe the real work isn't for you either. But I wonder why not. I mean two things. One is the, the joke is that I told somebody that I would spend a month in um, in Istanbul. I would I would pick from Muslim. I would have been I would have been a Sufi Muslim. Uh, I hung out with some amazing Sufi, um, uh, uh, Ghanaian Sufis um, in, in Istanbul. Uh, so I have immense respect for religion, but one of the, this is a personal issue. It's, to me, it's a, I, I'm a scientist. I was a born scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't lose that, and I almost wish I could. Mm -hmm. uh, I will always look at religion, no matter how much I can get to a point of respect for religion. And I have a mental I think if there's any switch I could turn in the sin world, I would turn up the religion and switch. Um, because I look at places like the sin world, places like Jordan, that are just, that are just they do not have the problems we have here. Um, but that's not who I am. I'm always going to be the person who, you know, given my personal background, given how much I travel as a child as well, I'm always going to be unable to really commit to the transcendent. 
interested in what's in it. That means that they don't So here's another example of that. So you talk about, you have really interesting blog posts about how similar England and Japan are. Um, and because they're, they're both island nations and they're both places where people will sort of nerd out over certain hobbies and like become obsessive um, and take a pride in their like both obsessive skill and knowledge about collecting something or making something. And you identify this in terms of, you know, like a, a kind of non-careerism and an ability to be satisfied with what you have, the ability to be satisfied with your life. Um, and you said they aren't so busy trying to change who they are. And it's very striking to me that when you describe like the goal of your travels, it's about trying to change yourself. Like you say that you know you're trying to change for the better. You're trying to become your true self. You're trying to change your perspective. So it, would this would you classify this with another thing about yourself that you don't like that you like your travel of the world, changing your perspective, being a bit dissatisfied with who you are, being unable to be satisfied with who you are, and these other people are kind of happy with who they are. Like, is, it, is that sort of the same as the belief? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I will, as I said, we're weirds. And I, I think, I mean, I don't, I, I will never tell anybody not to be an intellectual. I will never tell anybody not to send it. You know, like, on this trip, I brought Plato's Republic on the side. I have questions about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I mean, so, I, I, and the other thing is, I don't cost like being working class. I don't need working class names. I, I, I'm very honest with who I am. Because that gains you a lot more respect than trying to pretend to be somebody who. People have a great ability to figure out that face. <laughs> so, being who you are. Um, and so, I don't, I don't, you know, I, don't, you know, I would just walk in South Chicago and just walk from the street across that way. I just tell people, no, I don't lie. Um, but um, but I, I do have an immense respect for people. You know, I'm going off chart here. I'll give you wrong. I'm going to your trip. Yeah. Is it is it is it is it Kierkegaard who talks about anxiety in themselves or something like that? Anxiety. anxiety. It's quite possible, but I don't know. Okay, but there's this idea that you know you don't know who you are. And that, that brings an anxiety. I mean that that to me is actually, you know, when I when I read that little bit of Kierkegaard, I was listening to what he was saying, my response was, most people don't have that. <laughs> it's only us who do that. We're the only people who sit around. Yeah. And, and, and to me, the other other thing I strongly believe in, which is probably slightly controversial, I believe there are some cultures that work better than others. And if you're playing in some world, there are cultures like that. And one of the, one of the things that a, a good culture does, it doesn't have a lot of people questioning who they are. They they're okay with they're comfortable in their own skin, and that's why I was also comparing to Japan in England because the working class, surprisingly, because of the calcified structure, the English working class actually, because they've never become an elite, they're like fuck it, I'm going to be proud to be who I am. I'm going to be a saucer, you know, and so they can, they're allowed to build a culture. Yeah. And when I wrote about this, someone said the other thing is the, the elites and, 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 and you know, the monarchy and the elites are so ridiculous, they don't want to be them anyways. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 we, are, we in the U.S. are one of the few places in the world where we're always striving to be somebody else. We're not comfortable who we are. And that may work for us. That's great for us. That's great for you. That's great for me. I've changed my career four or five times. But that's not great for a lot of people. That sort of, you know, that sort of constant anxiety of, of not knowing who you are, what you need to be better, is actually causes people a lot, of, a lot of pain. You have a special love of a certain kind of institution that includes like um, like bars and pubs of various kinds and McDonald's, these kind of semi, like pu public spaces, but indoor spaces often where people drink together. Um, that's like kind of what you gravitate towards in any city. Um, can you just say a little bit about that? Um, well, I mean, um, the, it, it's, it's, I love places where people get together in But mm -hmm. one of the core lessons of what I take away from everything is, is humans are social animals. And I know that you're told that like in fourth grade, but people forget it. Like, um, community, 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 community. It matters immensely. And so 
But this morning, I woke up to get my coffee. I woke up at 5 to get my coffee. And I went to the Dunkin' Donuts. Your Starbucks is closed, so we went to Dunkin' Donuts. They, there's no seats. There's no seats. I have a sad picture of it. Uh, of this really, uh, you know, and that sucks because that's really important for people. So one of the things, one of the things I got known is I got known as the McDonald's guy because when I was going across the country, I ended up going into lots of McDonald's. I went to lots of McDonald's because that's where a lot of people I was studying, studying, was coming friends with. Um, Hacks. They go to McDonald's because it's a non-judgmental zone. You can go there in the morning. You can pick up your paper out of the newspaper, out of the garbage. Maybe get a get a get, a, get a old old can, sit there in the back corner, and be left alone, and not be judged. Um, you know, you're, you're, and then you also, more importantly, they can regain being part of the of, of the public, being part of the public in a way that allows them to actually be social and part of the community. Um, and that, so in any case, you know, people would say, what, what I kept on saying about McDonald's is the fact that McDonald's. Think about that. McDonald's, which is a banal franchise built on a quick transaction, has turned into community centers. That tells you how much people want community. They want community so much they'll do it in places like McDonald's. You know, I mean, that shows you how intense the need for community is. And it really is what I don't believe in but one of the few one of the few things that help that almost every culture I see shares is desire for community, an immense desire. You, there's a story that you tell about being in South LA, and you go to this place called the New Donuts. It's like <laughs> there's this woman, Maria, and she kind of scolds you for buying the wrong number of croissants, and you're kind of trying to get her to like you That's throughout true. the three or four days. And you know, on the, and on the last day, you're like, um, I'm, I'm, OK, I'm leaving today. And she says, have a nice life. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you comment on on this unrequited friendship. You say, such is the life of the transient, always stuck at a larval regularness, never able to mature to full grown regularness. Okay, so it's like you were trying to be a regular in effect right. for a short time, and she couldn't quite become a regular. That's what I wondered is, is there something about that that actually you like, that appeals to you a little bit? The larval, the larval. Oh, no, no, I hate the larval. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mad at Maria. <laughs> um, and when I flew back from Japan, I thought I was flying back via LA just to go in and see her. <laughs> and basically see, I'm here, here, here again. <laughs> Treat me like regular. Um, no, I, I absolutely love being like her. So one of the, uh, my other travel hacks is don't try to go to five million places. Like I was just back in Japan, in an aggregate of the course of the last few years, I spent about a month in Japan. And um, of that, maybe a week in Tokyo. I've been going to the same museum five now for, uh, when I was just there for three days. I ate there every three nights. And it's not a really special place. I literally found it by accident. So if you know Japan, you know uh, Tokyo, they have these sliding doors that automatically open. My eyes are not good, so I got up close to look and the doors open and immediately say, hi, right, come on in. And I had no choice but to go in. And now he's like my friend. Like I'm actually, I'm collecting, he, 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 he collects, um, Beach, shirts from beach clubs. So I got his address and he started sending me back shirts from beach clubs around the United States. Um, when I walked across Japan, I had stored some stuff, you know, he started stuff here. So it, it, becoming a regular allows you a glimpse into the community in a way that you just don't get, like, kind of, like, the food is not necessarily great compared to other these entitles. I can probably get better food, but that's not the point. Like, I really believe when I go to the I I, I, I jokingly, after I say I did the balance because the omelets. I like to be around places that actually have a strong So you know and here's like a pattern that I need to saw and you can tell me whether it's wrong. When you started out you went to Hunts Point and you were there that period, that was like two years of your life that you were going there with and you know um, and during that period you were also gradually attached to the very present banker of life, right? Now, and, um, and then you started traveling around the country. And you report that you spent like as much time, I wrote this down somewhere, but I'm not going to find you spent as much time as you needed in a place to like get to know the place or something. Which I don't know how much time that is, but I'm assuming it would be on the border of like a month. Um, it, it got, I got that. Um, so, yes, it, initially it was three weeks, and then I started honing it down to the point where 
Like, I wasn't only in Moldova for 12 days. It wasn't enough. So I want to go back. So that, in a way, was my question for you, because then when I look at your travels around the world, it seems like you're spending yet less time per place than you did when you were traveling in the United States. So the pattern seems to be that you're spending less and less time uh, so with a given place. So there are two things. One is I'm getting better at it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's not arrogance. It's just, you know, it's just uh, I've just gotten better at it. I know how to do this. Um, the second is what I'm doing now is kind of sort of, I call it kind of ethnic mm -hmm. um, And then I'm going to do deep dives and five or six episodes. Mongolia is going to be one of So right, I'm, I'm going back to Mongolia for this. Uh, so it's so different. Grossly reckless behavior. 
they're just they're living the American dream at its best. You know, they have the material wealth, they still have the also the spiritual wealth. Uh, okay, but but like they so is the thought really just well there are certain good things that money can buy and we want to buy them once we have money. But with those things come other bad things and we don't notice that we're getting bad. I think that's, I mean, that's it, but also I think, um, you know, the, the kind of individualistic, self-defined um, morality of the universe is very appealing. Like, it's, it's, it's pleasurable at a certain level. It's kind of the, kind of, it's the life of kind of a, you know, it's, it's you know, people, we, we are not necessarily good at denying pleasure when it has consequences at a long term. So I think there's a lot of appeal to the American consumers. Um, you know, and I think you wake up 30 years later, or two generations later, and you're spiritually dead. And you've forgotten that what, 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 the spiritual, what the spiritual wealth has brought you. So like, the world that you see as being spiritually dead is kind of your own world, right? Yeah. And the world. Well, but it's, it's also now. More and more working by the Right, so it includes your Yes. Um, um, I will just simply say that a lot of secular elites live very religious lives at a kind of like, you know, in terms of very conservative personal lives. <laughs> they, that they, they themselves don't necessarily preach that people should live. Strong nuclear families, um, you know, very, very, very rigorous. Uh, and almost a, almost a kind of Judeo Christian morality as well. Mm -hmm. so the question I wanted to ask you about the Zakayas and why is alcohol so important to socializing in so many places? Um, you know, um, this is one of the reasons I respect Islam. It is, um, there's not a lot of alcohol in Islam. The other place I absolutely love is uh, in Indonesia. I spent a lot of times in the compounds of Indonesia and in Jakarta. They're kind of a, in the US they'd be called slums. They're kind of these networks of alleys with open sewers and a lot of people make their um, money from you know, collecting garbage and other things. But they're extraordinarily functional. You don't have a lot of crime. You don't have a lot of, uh, you don't have a lot of, you have homes, you have very little addiction. You have a lot of, a lot of very little dysfunction. The reason being is because, quite simply, because there is a moral ban on alcohol. You know, moral bans are very different from, from government bans. <laughs> like you know, you, you, you can you can get or you can you can you can easily get around a government ban. It's hard to get around a moral ban. Uh, and so you know, this is this will this is going to be a slightly different like statement. I'm sorry, but it's cold and you know somebody in Indonesia. He says the great thing. I said, you know, I told him how much I liked the poems and I liked Jakarta. And he said, well, you know, we have just enough Islam here to drink, and not enough to become, to become suicide bombers. Right? It's the perfect kind of, you know, middle ground. Um, I want to ask you maybe two more questions, and I just gotta just gotta choose. Um, What do you think about the noble lot? Yeah, um, so I've 
think that um, because think in some senses, go ahead. I think the thing that terrified Plato about his own society was that nobody was really in charge and nobody was left in culture, and the culture was this kind of um, kind of mush that came up out of people coordinating with what they thought other people were doing. Um, and he's like, look, you gotta actually think this through and like plan it. And, and you know, in, in this ideal world, it's going to be organized. It's going to have a principle. Um, and I think he thinks most societies are not founded on principles uh, that's, that are going to exist in somebody's head. They are, um, they are awkward coordinations uh, on sets of ideas that are not clearly articulated and that maybe nobody would even affirm if they clearly thought that. But it's like, well, it's what everyone else is thinking, so I guess I have to go along. And not that the rulers or the elite like make those ideas up. Uh, pretty often, the rulers and the elite have better go along with those ideas, or they'll be taken out of power. Um, so the noble lie is an attempt to say, let's do something differently. The whole republic is an attempt to say, let's do this very differently from how it's usually done. Right? Um, and what he is saying, um, so, so is that. Um, we somehow need to make people feel, first, like they really come from a place. So your idea about how people have to be connected to a place, right? That, that resonated with me. Plato's like, yeah, so we tell them they were born from the soil, right? Which is, that actually is like a great, you know, in, in Thebes, there's this myth of they were, um, had so dragon's teeth and the Thebans emerged from the earth, right? So the myths of autophony of people can come out of the ground, that's one of the ways that people tell themselves, I'm from here. Because if you think about it, it's very weird to think I'm from this place, right? Like physically, I don't connect to dirt. And so, so that's one of the, so in a way, Plato's kind of affirming that myth and, and building it into society. He's like, that's a good idea. Um, but then the other part, in a way, the really, the really crazy part is this education that they have received is a dream. He wants them to think that, right? So that they didn't, that like, they didn't just get all this training, but that that was somehow, that they were somehow born knowing like, how to be who they are. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what to think of it. Um, I guess it's an attempt to naturalize culture. It's an attempt to make culture feel natural. But I think that has organically, I think you leave people alone. Mm -hmm. That organically happens. I mean, the kind of traditional societies are, or everywhere, the concept of place, well, one of the things I, one of the things, one of my pet peeves is when that comes out of both Jean and Kyrgyzstan and, um, and Mongolia, these are both traditional nomadic societies. And one of the things that, when people, people we hear nomadic, we think that they have no place. It's the opposite. They're extremely brown in place. They have, they look at us and say, you have only one home? I have three. <laughs> but the point is they return to those three places. Um, they, they, they cycle between those three places. And those places are immensely important. So the, even the nomads are actually defined by intense um, connection to place. I took this bus from Ulaanbaatar to the Russian border. Right? It was like, you know, just, and if you've been in Mongolia up in the steppe, it's just flat. Like it's just flat rolling field. No demarcations other than like. And then, you know, this woman was sitting right next to me. She was like the worst thing made ever because Mongolians had no sense of personal space and she was talking to her grandmother on the phone. <laughs> she had her, her name was grandma. <laughs> and she was juggling bags. But in any case, she, then she went up to the bus driver in the middle of nowhere, tapped him on the shoulder and got out and started walking. And she knew that place. You know, and I, I said this to this friend I had in Mongolia. I said, that's, and she goes, well, you know, she, she she says Mongolians know every peak, like up, up on the step. They they have to, they have to know that. That's their life. And so there's this immense connection to place. So the connection to place, I think, is actually a very very human thing. I don't think I don't think we have to install it in anybody. I think in, in some senses, place, faith, and race. Unfortunately, race, place, faith, faith, and on family are kind of things that are organic. And I think in some senses it's, it's the requirement of the elites, of the Plato types, to figure out a way to coordinate those in a way that they don't you know, cause 
cause a lot of violence. Right, I think that that's what's right. It's that, it's that what Plato wants to do is start a new society, but make it feel like. Right. But I don't think he has to do that, because I think those things are natural. But they aren't natural. He wants to destroy the ones that exist. He wants to take children, a bunch of children, away from their parents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and start a new society, right? And then he wants to make them feel, in a way, like it's old. Um, and so, so he wants he wants to put it's like it's like it's like stitching in his intellectual ideas into people's souls. Um, okay, let's take a break. Um, so uh, we'll take a break for about 15, 15, 20 minutes, and there's cookies and chocolate. Um, that. Um, all right, questions. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, should I stand up or? Yes, yeah, stand up and try to be also try to be loud because normally we also have mics for the questioners, but we've never been in this room before, so some glitches, yeah. Okay, hi, um, thanks so much for speaking at this event, first of all. Um, I guess my question, for context, I'm also an international student, so this has something, this was something that has always been on my mind, which is like, basically, like, aside from the consumers factor of it all, like, what is with Americans' obsession with traveling? And like, I guess also <laughs> given that you mentioned, like, you know, you believe that there's a human tend tendency to like be grounded at some like physical space. Yet a lot of the people I've seen, at least in this country, always have an urge to leave and be somewhere new or like, yeah, someplace else uh, other than that, like where they originate from. Wait a minute, you're an international student. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is also very true. <laughs> So like, I feel I like you have some first-hand understanding. I have my own reasons, but I guess I want to deliver. Wait, wait, wait. Who says that? Uh, <laughs> maybe part of the problem, huh? Maybe I am. Where are, you, where are you from? I'm from South Korea. Okay. Yeah. Where, where in South Korea? Um, this small city called Suwon that no one's ever heard of. Okay. Unless you've been there in, like, random places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this whole debate, this whole discussion started when I criticized Agnes's uh, article. Which what was the name of it? Traveling sucks, basically. I actually can't. The case against travel. Um, Not my title. There is, there is a, there is a case to be made against that type of travel, um, where it, it's almost become a luxury brand, where people just go, take an Instagram of themselves in front of the Eiffel Tower, or to go to, um, you know, go to. Um, you don't get that many people like that going to Seoul, I guess. No. Um, or go to K-pop pictures, you know. Um, but there is almost a kind of transactional sense. There's a, there's a level of travel that's become transactional, um, basically made from the fact that we're wealthy and it's pretty cheap to travel. Um, you know, you can Americans can go to Mexico and live it up. You know, a working class guy in South Carolina can go for a week in Mexico and live like kind of royalty. And so I think there's just, there's some of the, there's a very transactional, just simply, they're going to party at a cheap cost. Um, and, you know, a lot of these countries are encouraging it, um, especially the, in the Caribbeans and certain countries have made, turned travel and tourism into their, their primary industry. I mean, you know, Jordan, which is one of my favorite countries, doesn't have a lot of resources and it's, it's trying to build itself, brand itself as travel. I think that um, there are a few things in the world, um, one of them is travel and another one is novels, that people think change you but only in a good direction. Which is weird if you think about it, that there should be anything where it's going to change and transform you, but guaranteed positive, right? Um, and so uh, I think there is just this idea of like, it's going to somehow be transformative, it will somehow be a new me, and so then that's going to appeal to the population that wants that. Yeah, I mean, and it may be that Americans, for some of the reasons that Chris was giving, want that. I mean, eat, pray, love, I mean, you know, set off a whole generation. You know, you, you, I, I will run into people in like, you know, Frankfurt Airport who have that damn book, you know, in, in their, clutched in their hand. I guess if it's for like a search for meaning then, is there anything that you think personally is like a better way to have meaning in life, if that makes sense. In terms of tr from from travel, or, not necessarily I mean, travel. If you don't think that, like, I, I mean, mean I, I know I, you mentioned I, that. I, philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I I would say that you know, three thousand years of history across every country has been religion. Like religion, work, there's religion there for a reason. You know. Fair enough. Take 
thank you. Next question. Um, yes, in the back there, yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so my question is like, what made you do this kind of drastic shift from like 2011 being on like you know, Wall Street, being a boss trader, being like, yeah, I'm gonna start traveling now. And kind of like walk through the mindset of like how 20 years like the peak of capitalism kind of led you to this like moment over like, yeah, I wanna see how Mongolians live. Um, I think the, you know, when I wrote my book, and that I was I should have been prepared for that question, which is like, why did you go from being a bond trader to hanging out with heroin addicts in the Bronx? Um, but I didn't have an answer um, because um, and then they would just simply say, are you working through some guilt? Is this kind of like, you know, um, and, you know, I, I push back against that. But I think at some level it's partially true. I mean, I think but it, there was a sense of it. I mean, there was a sense of dissatisfaction in my life. Um, you know, I think I told that to someone here and they said, well, you were a bond trader. <laughs> like, yeah, um, but I had got into it. I kind of got into it naive. I kind of fell into it naively um, and I enjoyed it for about five or six or seven years. But then it felt very shallow. Um, and um, but if you look at the arc going from um, particle physics, from math to particle physics to uh, bond trading to this, it's basically moving away from being a guy who was really good at numbers and didn't have to think about anything else to being a guy who thinks, hey, you know, there's another way to learn. Um, you know, it's just like this entire world, thinking about the world as a spreadsheet, you know, might not be the full way to live a life, a full life. So it, it's a move from going from being very, very 100% quantitative to being very qualitative and from a kind of a book learning to experiential learning. I tack a question onto that that I had. Um, the stuff that you learn from traveling, what percent of it goes into your sub stack? Um, I mean, 60% in terms of, um, like, there's a lot of deeper questions I'm working through, and I don't really, mm -hmm. like, I don't want to inflict them on the audience. Mm -hmm. um, or I haven't figured out, I haven't figured out the question I'm really working through. Mm -hmm. um, and... So, you know, going back to an earlier question, you said it was like I, the, the recent trips, the two recent trips I did were, were too short. Um, and so I'm, I'm moving back to going back to a lot. Mm. And, and some of that's reflective in the idea that uh, I feel like I, I didn't get out of it, get as much out of it as I should have. So I, 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 I went from doing really long trips to very kind of narrowing it down a, a over over shot. So but so. Um, there are some things I, I don't, there's a lot of things I don't write about to basically protect the people who tell me their stories. Um, I don't think it's necessarily right if someone tells you their full details of their life. They, they don't necessarily, part of the reason I moved to Substack and part of the reason I made it private was when I was doing the Bronx, I had not understood that these people are gonna become basically characters in a reality show. And uh, you know, it became the whole ethical issue became very, very problematic. And I'm like, I so I step back. And so, part of the reason is I, I, I there, there's just stuff I leave out for the for the quote, you know, just because I don't think it's right to talk about these stories, you know, to make people look bad necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the purple shirt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm really curious about like this question of walking, because I also have the sense that there's something very special about walking. But I kind of want to know why, like, does it um, kind of help us rebuild our sense of place? Or, like, what does it do? For me, uh, for me as an educational tool, I mean, I, I do what I do because I want to learn, first and foremost. Um, I mean, that, that's not everybody's goal. That's my goal. One of the things I've learned, one of the things I've discovered is if you, so the kind of rule of thumb I do is I, I, I only use buses in my feet. I don't use cabs. I mean, I uh, only, only an extreme duress, you know, if cabs, like in, in Mongolia, people use shared cabs. Like you go to the bus station and there's a cab and same thing in, in Vietnam. So that you use a cab because it's really kind of a micro bus. Um, but it forces you to see the part you may not want to see. It's like it forces you to read the novel all the way through instead of skipping through fast forward through the parts you don't want to see. In some sense of a, putting my old mathematician's hat on, I think of it as a random information generator it throws at you. Like, you know, I didn't necessarily want to learn about X, but I learned about X because I was forced to, you know, go through that neighborhood. Um, and 
the other thing is, is you know, you can oversimplify place like I often do, but places, countries are an amalgamation of a confederation of different cultures, and cities are confederations of different neighborhoods. And when you walk through a city, what I do when I get to a city, for instance, just um, when I got to Ulaanbaatar, the first thing I did the next day, I got in at night, the next day, I looked at the map, and I walked literally across Ulaanbaatar. It was like 18 miles. Um, and I learned <laughs> about Ulaanbaatar by walking those 18 miles. Um, and then I, then I try to walk the other direction, necessarily. And then I hone in on what kind of interested me. But in some senses, it's a, it's a, it's a learning, it's almost a computerized yearning process, where the first input is kind of this forced information that shows you the entire picture. Do you ever feel like, but what's really interesting is what's going on behind closed doors? Um, you can get, the more you spend, you get access to that. Mm. Um, you know, and so th that really is kind of, in many ways, the goal is to get behind those closed doors. Mm. Um, there are certain places where it's hard. Like, you know, um, when I was in the, when I was in the Palestinian neighborhood of Jordan, the working class Palestinian neighborhood of Jordan, you know, there is there is a lot of barriers there, because um, I, I, I can't hide who I was. Similar in Senegal, when Senegal I couldn't when I was in um, Dakar, I cannot hide who I am in Dakar. I can't kind of blend in anymore, as being kind of like I clearly am a wealthy white guy who has who, who's a foreigner, and you know, there the, the dynamic there can never be erased, mm -hmm. um, and so it makes it harder, and so. You, you, what you try to do is spend more time, spend more time, spend more time, you know. Um, and, and, you know, the, over time, you, the, some of those barriers will be erased, but not fully. You'll never, you'll ne never fool yourself into thinking you can become a local, <laughs> ever. Yeah. Hi, I'm curious if you could, earlier you talked about you wanted to stay in a place long enough that you truly got a sense of it, and I'm curious, how did you know that you truly had a sense um, like the, the example I use, I mean, the recent example is, um, and this is a negative example in the sense of when I went to Taipei, so I was there for a week. Uh, I had scheduled to be there for three weeks in Taipei. I was there for a week and I hated it. Um, and I wrote a really dismissive piece about Taipei. Um, and um, I even called my family up and I said, I, I got to figure out I could change these tickets, man. I want to come back. Um, and I couldn't, and it was good that I couldn't, because I had said in my piece, I said that in Taiwan, there's absolutely no sense of faith, and that's entirely wrong. I had noted like there were a lot of temples, but then I hadn't realized how central the kind of what they call Chinese folk religion is to Taiwanese life. And being there for, forced to be there for another two weeks, forced me to actually explore that side. So, um, you, you, you know, when I, I, the example I used to use was when I was in um, um, Prestonburg, Tennessee, Kentucky, back in 2015 or so. You know, I spent three, four days there, and I thought I understood it. And the piece I w w was writing would have been basically the piece that everybody who goes to Prestonburg, Tennessee writes. And I said, no, no, there's got to be more to it than that. So I stayed another two weeks. I went into, I went into, um, I went into some uh, Pentecostal churches. I, you know, I just dug down deeper, and then I just saw a whole different level to Prestonburg that I hadn't seen before by forcing myself. Because I said to myself, "I'm just writing the same thing that anybody else would write. Like, there's got to be more here to it than that." Um, so, I mean, you never really know. <laughs> like, I'm still learning about Japan. I'm still learning about Korea. I'm still learning about. I mean, I, you know, I have a, I have a. I have a step up on England, and I'm still learning about it. You know? um, yes. Yes, you who just turned out, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you've talked a lot about kind of how this kind of state of travel uh, has helped your own understanding of the world, kind of your own uh, advancement, I guess, like as like, uh, like a, a big. But um, what about kind of on the scale of society? Do you think that? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you physically. Okay, um, so you've talked a lot about how this type of travel has kind of helped you in your understanding right. of the world. Uh, but what about on the scale of society? Do you think if more people engage in this kind of thick travel, 
would it change something for kind of how we make decisions um, that relate to, to kind of people on the world? Like, if you went back to Wall Street, would you do anything differently as a result of these experiences? I mean, I wouldn't go back to Wall Street. <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, I, again, going back to something we, me and Agnes were talking about earlier is I think most people in here at some level are going to be in positions of power at some point in their life. And, um, you know, being here in Hyde Park has been really nice, but it's also a bit of a la-la land. I mean, this isn't reality. Like, you know, you walk... 15 blocks that way, 20 blocks that way, and you realize very quickly this is not reality. Like, everybody here gets along, it's great, we all believe in equality, all that, and we're, all, we're not living very equal lives, just 15 blocks from us. So I think it's important to know what's around you. And again, you know, you can live above a life, that's fine, but you're gonna end up making choices that are gonna be detrimental to the people you, you, you think you wanna help. And I think, but there is a bit of a paradox here, right? Because as a trader, that, it, it was in that capacity that you were, in some sense, being very influential over the lives of other people. I, like, is it that you now have a, a different way to be very influential, like to, to, in effect, take your place in the elite and be very influential, but now informed by this wisdom? Or is it that you just don't want to do that? I don't want to do that, but I, I, what I do want other people to do is, Going back to what I said to you right before we had this talk, I'm trying to, I don't have the answers necessarily. I'm trying to give people out there who think about these things the question, the information to, to start building the answers. Mm. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to make policy. I don't want to be involved in policy. Um, and I, one of the things I took away from Wall Street is, um, you know, is because if you talk to me, you know, in 20, 2000, 23 years ago, um, I would have told you that, you know, being on Wall Street was no more selfish than being a particle physicist. Like, you know, like, what, what do particle physicists do for, do good for the world? In a case, like, you sit around in a room and like crunch numbers that don't don't change anything. Um, so I would have said what I was doing was neither good nor bad. It was just benign. And then after 2007, you know, I realized, you know, what, <laughs> it wasn't good. <laughs> mm. Yes. Sorry, you, you, yes, in the sweat, yes. Sure. Um, yeah, so you mentioned, I think, faith, place, race, family, maybe a few other things as like characteristics that give people identity. Um, I'm curious, do you think national identity or yeah. some type of political identification is one of those things? And if so, is it destructive or productive? Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> it can go too far, as you know, history has shown. But I think it, that's certainly what, that's what, operates in Japan, an immense, immense uh, national pride, an immense sense of being Japanese. Um, I think that operates in a lot of countries. Uh, we're one of the few countries who don't really have a kind of, um, <clears throat> a kind of uniform national pride. And in some senses, we're weird because our elites don't like our country. Um, it's kind of the opposite in every other country. But, um, in some senses, our national, I've always said that our kind of national, it's almost paradoxical that our national identity is one of um, what I call the American dream, which is to, to always kind of, you know, it's not forged based on a common um, culture. It's, for, it's forged from a, based on a common goal, you know, to, to get wealthy, to have your kids be better than you, have lived lives better than you, um, to kind of, to kind of, to know if you are, if you have an idea that's better than anybody else's idea, and if you work harder than anybody else's, you're going to get, you're going to get, you're going to get rewarded for that. that. That kind of aspirational, we we have we share an aspirational sense that uh, I think is very different from other countries who share a kind of a culture. Um, yes, yes. Uh, Sorry, I was pointing to her. <laughs> what, what neighborhood? Um, Kingsbridge. Okay. <laughs> um, but I was kind of wondering about when you talked about this like need in the West to kind of improve oneself or like change constantly, like this discontent, and how you know in more religious communities they might not like have that. They have like more 
kind of contented experience of life. But a very fundamental part of religiosity is like this desire to be more godly or like okay. to change, right? And I was wondering, do you think that the problem in the West is a lack of religion or kind of like a worship? I don't want to use like a key word, but a worship of a false like God, maybe. Um, I think it's kind of a little bit of both. Um, but I think when you, when, you, when you think about trying to be more spiritual, right? That's, that's self-improvement, right? That's, 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 that doesn't bring the same sort of anxiety of kind of always trying to have more, have more, have more, have more. Like um, you're working within a system where the rules are pretty well defined versus the capitalist system of meritocracy where the, rule, where, where, where the rules are not very well defined. But I, I think the other thing is, is um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems with what I, what I call our faux meritocracy is, you know, this idea, it, it's a great system that says, you know, you get what you deserve. The, the, the corollary to that is if you don't succeed, you're a loser. And so it makes a lot of people feel miserable. Um, whereas I think in faith, you can, you can still be very content and still feel like a child of God or a child of um, um, Allah if you, you are not perfect. <laughs> You're still welcome into the... You know, the um, going back to the Muslim thing, why I was so drawn in was, and I think you know this, and I think it's very foreign to, to Westerners, is the mosque is always open. Like, like as a Catholic, like, you know, you're lucky if it's open on, you know, one day a week now. But the, the mosque I go to in um, Uskadar, um, it's a community center. Like, it's, you can go use a the bathroom there. You can wash up there. You can go in basically any time between first prayer and last prayer. It's just this, it's just this extraordinarily open place that allows you to always work on yourself. You, you, even if you're not perfect, you still have a place. But is it, is it just the community part that's important, or is there something fundamentally about religion? I, I actually think, um, I mean, I think there's two, I have two, two, two theories about this. One is, I, I have the thing I call the address and universe of meaning. We all need to know our address and universe of meaning. It used to be a finite, it used to be, I'm a math guy, it used to be a vector. You could summarize it by like seven variables. We've turned it into an infinite variable. You, it's bespoke. You make whatever you are. <laughs> by definition, that's a community of one. <laughs> like that's by definition going to create loneliness. If you, if you can create your own, your own bespoke identity, you're going to be like nobody else. You're going to have no community. So there's that. But also I think you need what I call a, um, a ultimate transcendent value. See, faith or religion or transcendent or the spiritual, like I always say is the, 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 the rug that's too, big, that's too big for the room, you can push it down in one place, it's going to pop up to something else. People are drawn to the transcendent. They need something that's not banal in their life. They need something that's, that makes them feel that this life, this, this time here is not all there is because if you really think about it, this time here being all there is, is really depressing. <laughs> So there's a want for some, some sense of transcendence, for the sense of the immortality in some level, and religion provides that. Do you think like academia was part of like the replacement for that? Like I think. I think in the in the West, the what's replacement for faith is politics. Like I mean, you know, it's it's we, you know, I, I think it's careerism, but careerism has no transcendence. So the, the way to think about, the way I can think about the transcendence is, is almost, you want to be on the right side of history. Like if you're, if you're, if you're a faithful Muslim, you're, you're, you know you're on the right side of history. You don't need to be convinced of that. You know it. Um, and, and we replace that in politics. You want to know that you have the right politics and that when you die, your, your kids won't be embarrassed of the positions you had. <laughs> I think that there's this, like, a lot of people, a lot of believers in just struggle with their faith. Uh, they struggle, like, certainly I have, not just with faith, but with just being angry at God, um, uh, being, 
you know, feeling like it's very, very hard to uh, think through the problem of evil, um, all those things. And so it, it does seem to me that there are many really canonical tortured religious experiences. Um, and they're recorded in world literature as well, right? So um, it's certainly not the case that all religious people are simply contented and, they, and their religion gives them a kind of contentment. Um, um, and so I, I think there is still a question that remains, why is it that some of the time religion is, for some people, a source of contentment? Maybe, I mean, I, even there, like, I wonder, I wonder something about how, okay, a little bit of a digression, but I was talking to my husband today about this text called A Confession by Tolstoy, in which Tolstoy has this, like, midlife crisis uh, about the meaning of life and what's the point of anything, and he's like, so what if I'm a great novelist and an amazing all-around guy and an aristocrat and I have this amazing family and I'm super strong? Uh, you know, what does any of that mean? Why do I care? And... Uh, and he is, he has been religious his whole life, but he is, he's like grasping for his religion and it's not working. And he looks at the peasants and he's like, I wish I could be a peasant. You know, they're just so, they're so contented with their simple ideas and how they just don't think about these questions. And so they live more happily. And like, this is just a really strong recurring dynamic of the tortured people look at some group that seem non-tortured, but it's from the outside that they seem non-tortured. So I, like, I, uh, I guess I, 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 one wants to hear, I suppose I wanna hear that non-tortured position articulated from the inside, um, because it seems to me that religion by itself, at least for many of us, doesn't just cure this particular existential problem. And maybe the existential problem on some level is caused by wealth, right? Um, by wealth and leisure. I think leisure causes a lot of problems because people don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to use their free time and they suddenly have to ask who they are. Um, I'm not sure that's a bad thing, but, um, but, 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 but religion by itself, it seems to me, is just, it's just like implicated in all the human struggles. I, I, I used to say that um, wealth protects you from the evidence for God <laughs> because um, to me, being, being religious is ultimately about having humility, about, about accepting that you'll never know everything. That, that, you know, again, I go back to us being weirdos, maybe you, us, and me. <laughs> but um, um, we think we can solve everything. You know, you give, a, you, give a, you give me, back when I had a PhD, back when I was a bond trader, a problem, I'm like off to the library off to the computer, I'll figure this out. Given enough compute CPU, given enough time, we're gonna solve this problem. And I just think there are some problems that can't, and I think, I think people who live harder lives, I don't wanna romanticize like life in the guerra, it's not easy. I don't wanna romanticize life as a peasant, it sucks. Life in Senegal sucks. Um, but um, they understand, I think, better um, our, our mortality um, because life is more dangerous. Um, they understand better that there are things you just can't solve. You know, they have a more intimate understanding of nature as a, this force that can't be dealt with necessarily. You can't, you know, always beat the snowstorm. So I think um, in some senses, to me, truly faithful people are, are humble in a very deep sense in a sense that they know that you know, humans are only so, so good at so many things that they're not gonna solve everything. Um, yes, yeah. Um, so you sort of talked about how the purpose behind your travel is to write. Um, a lot of things that you're talking about in terms of culture and the lived experiences of other cultures are sort of not translatable into the words that you write, right? So, are you sort of painfully aware of the things that you can't translate, or do you block out the things that you can't translate? Um, I mean, I mean, I'll just use M M Mongolia just because I got back from there. I don't understand Mongolia. Um, I mean, it's such a different way of life, and so that's why I'm going to go back. I may never understand it. Um, uh, I, you know, I, 
to the degree I have a pattern to my travels, it's been based around religion and, and world religion. So I did a Muslim phase <laughs> um, and I did a secular phase. Um, and, um, you know, I did a kind of what I, what, they, what the anthropologists dismissively call proto-religions, kind of, you know, folk religions. Um, and, 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 you know, at some point, I think you just have to understand, there's, there's only, there's some, there's some cases where the answer to that one is yes. There's certain, there's certain things I know I will never understand. And that's kind of what I said, you know, there, when I was doing my work in the Bronx, I got criticized as being an outsider doing it. And I made the argument that sometimes the outsider can see things that the insiders can't see. Because, you know, the insiders, it's, it's the water they swim in, so they can't see it. Um, so what you, I think if you want to understand a place, you need two perspectives. You need the outsider's perspective and you need the insider's perspective. I'm never gonna give you the answers about like, you know, like I can't tell, I can't explain Mongolia to you. I can give you part of it. You, the, the other part needs to come from, from the, the words of the Mongolians themselves. Um, yes. Uh, hi, so I have two questions that I don't know if we're allowed to ask too. The first one is, I also really like travel and actually recently I was just in Istanbul for a study abroad. So when you talked about Sufi um, religious people, like they, our professor took us to a lodge and we got to see them too. So I agree that it's a very interesting experience, but normally like what do you observe and how do you observe it in the people to kind of like gather the information that you're trying to see? And then my other question is, which you can answer later, if there is an answer, it's like advice you have for sort of like a solution to this placelessness that a lot of us feel. Um, the, the first one goes, the first one is the methodology is kind of basically walking. And so it's kind of like, it really is, a, even though it's a structured walk, at some point turns into a random walk where like, you know, I got to know these, um, <clears throat> I got to know these, uh, these Ghanaian Sufi students simply because, you know, I kept going to the same mosque. I repeat my process. I, I build a routine over time to try to become a regular at some level. And they kept seeing me in this one mosque and they started talking to me. And then we, you know, we started hanging out together and then we, you know, we started. So it's, it's kind of a, I think there's a gender issue here. As a guy, it's kind of easier in some ways to basically become friends with anybody because, <laughs> you know, there's, you don't have to worry about alternative motives. Um, and so consequently, um, I just become friends with anybody. I'm very willing to go anywhere. Like if someone says, hey, I want to show you blank, I'll go, okay, <laughs> let's go see blank. Um, so there's an immense, you know, openness to kind of new, new things. Um, Wait, can I interrupt you there? Because I feel like, okay, I feel like you've said this, but there's some kind of gift you have that you maybe do not realize you have it. Like when, uh, when I came up here uh, and um, Chris was at the other end of the room and I was like, oh, I'm glad you got in. Uh, because the door was locked, um, but the security guard, you know, we, uh, we she, and, she and I propped the door. And Chris is like, oh yeah, you know, she just moved here from Detroit. Uh, she's from Arkansas originally. <laughs> and like, she, like I also spent a few minutes downstairs with the security guard. In fact, we had to solve a practical problem of how to prop the door, right? I know nothing about her. So I just ask people questions. Right. So, so, okay. So that's, that's important. It's important information, okay, right? Oh, people I apologize. Want to be like I you. I, I, oh, okay. <laughs> you ask people yeah. questions and also somehow they want to talk to you. Sorry. Somehow. I mean, so, so, I feel so, like if I ask people questions, sometimes, I mean, a lot of times I ask people questions, they're pretty annoyed at me. So, so <laughs> you're doing something else. So part of, what? Not yet. So, so part of the, part of the thing is, um, so this will be a slightly long story and I apologize. I was, I, I, I was a very shy child. I was a very shy person. I was a nerd, a very nerdy guy. Um, and when I got to Wall Street, um, my first year in Wall Street, I come out of a PhD program. Like, you, know, you don't need social skills to be in a PhD program in physics. Um, and I can remember exactly where I was on the N train. And I was, dry, I was home, commuting home first year in Wall Street in my little suit. And I had this epiphany where I realized I was always bad at at the, the beginning when you first introduce somebody, like, do you, do you shake your hands? I didn't know the etiquette, you know, the, the awkwardness of first introductions. And then it came to me is everybody's awkward in those introductions, so stop caring. <laughs> like, just go into mm -hmm. them. 
And because I, 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 a friend once summarized me as somebody who goes into places I'm not expected to go into. Um, I went down to a black bar down there, a lounge, where I was the only white person. I've done that in many, many towns. The first five seconds is weird. Like, I became a regular in Milwaukee in the Scorpion Lounge. And I remember when I was in Milwaukee doing my things, it's an entirely black neighborhood. I had all these kind of very well-meaning Democrats who, when I said, oh, I'm going to go down to the Scorpion Lounge, you're going to want to join me. Oh, and it's not safe there. You're going to get killed. Like, they shoot people there. Like, you know, it was like, what? <laughs> like, I walked in, and it was a bit awkward. But, you know, within five minutes, I was drinking with everybody. They were asking me questions. Um, in some senses, the fact that I'm so different brings them to ask me questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know who Thomas Wolfe was. He was a writer. He wrote uh, The Electric Kool-Aid. He wrote The Right Bonfire Stuff. Um, he wrote The Bonfire of the Vanities. He would go around. He, he did something similar to what I did. He wrote a story about the Bronx back in the 80s. He would show up in the Bronx, this white guy, in this impeccable white suit. Impeccable white suit. If you know the Bronx, the Bronx is 99% Hispanic and black, okay? If you show up as a white guy in an impeccable white suit, if you look at a picture, just Google Tom Wolf white suit, you'll see. Um, and someone asked him about it, he says, he goes, it brings conversation to me. He says, I know I'll never fit in. I'm never gonna fit into the Bronx, so I might as well just lean, I'm putting words in his mouth here. Um, I'll lean into this. <laughs> I'll lean into being the outsider. And that's me, because I, I, you know, most of my work has been being the sole white person. Uh, the sole, you know, very, very different. I stick out. And when I was doing my work in the U.S., I would go into the McDonald's, I would sit at a table, I would take my camera and I'd put it there, and I would just sit there and I'd wait. For sometimes all night, I wouldn't talk to people. People that would eventually come up to me and start asking me questions. Mm -hmm. And so... That was, the, you know, that was the process by which I gained kind of, you know, a lot of people use McDonald's as shelters at night. So a lot of people who were coming up to talk to me were people who were, were, you know, were homeless. They'd come up and just start sitting, but you know, within three, I would just go back to the same McDonald's, same table, write up my notes at night, um, and play on my computer, and eventually people would come talk to me. They'd be drawn by the fact that I was so different, and then you just bring in conversations. But, like, that conversation, okay, that, that's a, that is a quote, a little gimmick I learned, which is 98% of African Americans in Chicago and Milwaukee come from Mississippi um, event, basically at some point. M Milwaukee is even, it's almost 100%. The actual process by which African Americans came to uh, Milwaukee was um, they, um, the Immigration Act of 32 closed down um, a cheap source of, of labor from Eastern Europe. So they sent, they, and then as the war ranked up, they sent, they sent recruiters down to Sunflower County, Mississippi, and they just brought up um, African Americans out of the, out of, out of the um, cotton fields. Um, and I knew this because when I spent time in the Milwaukee's McDonald's, I got to know a lot of these people. I ended up writing some of the stories, and their story was all the same. So when I heard her downstairs, and I did it to the woman at the parade, I said, I, I detect a southern accent. She goes, how do you know? <laughs> I said, you must be from Mississippi. She goes, yeah, I'm a kid now. She, goes, she, she wasn't from Mississippi. Her family was from Arkansas. But, um, but one of the most frustrating things I find online is there's this meme that asking people where they're from is offensive. Everybody wants to talk about where they're from. So, you know, I, I've never once had anybody, I'll just point and say, where are you from? I said, you know, you know, sometimes I'll say, like to you, I'll say, um, where are your parents from? You know, or, you know, something like that. And nobody wants, nobody's offended by that. Nobody. Like, the only people who offended are people, I guess, are people on, on Twitter. But, like, They're like you, so. can, you can just ask people very blunt questions. Um, as long as you, you know, if, if you're well intended about it, you know. Mm. Like. Yes. Yeah. Bunch of questions. I'll try to stick with just one. Um, so I think um, my question has a lot to do with what Agnes said in response to the question about religion. Um, so in the context of thin versus thick travel, um, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, you spoke about how 
you want to travel to see how people see the world, people of other cultures see the world, or how they see themselves in the world. Right? Now, you chose to move away from a way of life, a particular way of life, towards a different way of life, from one mode of learning to a different mode of learning. Right. Right? Um, so it seems that you know, in the act of travel as intentional, there's an inherent bias, right? Because you're choosing to look for something as opposed to, in, you know, in comparison with somebody who accidentally just finds themselves somewhere. So when there is the possibility of that inherent bias in the act of travel, how do you differentiate or how do you distinguish between A, seeing how people see the world, and B, seeing how you want them to see the world? Um, especially right, especially I, given that, you know, how Agnes spoke about how um, some of these things that you describe are almost with a sense of envy, you know, in terms of like real jobs um, and things like that. How do you distinguish between what you want to see and, you know, what these people are my, my, my view is you can never get rid of your bias. I mean, it's very, like, so one of the questions I expect Agnes to ask me um, was, you don't have to travel because you can read people like me. And my response is, I, I'm biased. I come with a bias. Never trust an author. <laughs> you know, d you know. I, 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 one of the, I write a piece every 10 days now on my travels. And if you've ever filed a piece every 10 days, I'm sick of my own pieces. I'm sick of my own writing. And I'm sick of my own biases. Like, I, when I find myself starting to write the same kind of, right now it's all about, kind of America being too obsessed with materialism, America being too obsessed with individuality. I'm getting frustrated with that because it, it's clear that I'm looking for that at some level. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's a big problem, you know? And so I, I don't think you can ever lose it. Like, you know, back when I was doing kind of work with, with addicts and, and, and prostitutes, um, I got criticized a lot for ethics. And I, I, I would have loved to have a conversation with the critics about ethics. Is you, because it, it's an ethical minefield. You can't do journalism um, without being unethical at some level. The very process by, of going out and writing other people's stories and is inherently <laughs> ethically flawed. Um, and so there was a brief period I didn't talk about where I actually wrote a novel. Um, part of the reason I wrote the novel because I was so tired of the ethical issues of journalism mm -hmm. that one of the great things about novels is um, you can distill what you've learned in a way that protects the individual who you're writing about. Um, but but the, the, to the question of biases, you can't get rid of your biases. I mean, you can try. You can try your best. And one of the things you can try the best to do is to engage with lots of people like this, <laughs> you know, critics who, who say, well, you know, you should engage with your critics because sometimes they're right. Can I also ask my other question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I know I've written up, I'm trying to be articulate, but um, so I think that the act of traveling is really, um, complicated and there's a lot of tension there based on you know who the body is that is doing the traveling and and the race that that body is reflecting because um historically like the act of colonization um was a division of world between people who did the knowing and people who were known right whether that was settler colonialism in north america or exploitation colonialism in the global south so like if as as, as a white body that is doing the traveling um, is this this history of you know this history of being the knower because you are still traveling to know and to learn so does that history have a place in this current relationship that you have with travel is there a connection there and um, how do you engage with that connection I mean this is a this is a, a landmine of a question um, but and I would love to talk about it more um, one one thing I would I'd say is I'm very much a believer that when you're in a country you're their guest. Like, um, and that extent, I would even say, so I can start a whole rant right now, now about nonprofit institutions and, and, and charity organizations, um, which I think is modern colonialism. It's modern intellectual colonialism. When I was in Senegal, okay, Dakar is not rich. Dakar by, by is no stretch. Dakar is a dirty, filthy, um, loud, poor city. Um, it happens to be Muslim. Um, which is partially why I was there, but I was also there because you can't know the world if you don't know Africa. Um, I stayed at a hotel that was relatively nice, but it was 35 bucks a night, okay? 
day. It was kind of an old, it was back from the old colonial period when the, when the colonialists were the Lebanese um, to some degree, who is the merchant class there. It was run by a Lebanese. Um, uh, um, the, when I was there, there was a global health conference in Dakar. It was at a hotel that was $450 a night, okay? The hotel, so Dakar has lots of ocean front. Um, the parts that the local Senegalese use is filthy. Um, the parts that the tourists use is, is gated off and pristine. And this global health conference was in a place that cost $450 a night. And I walked around the perimeter of this, this compound there were open sewers running right in, you know, there was, there was not a lot of global health. But these people, these damn attendants, flew into the car airport, got into these, these Jeeps, and then went to the, to the conference, stayed in the conference, ate immaculate food. I mean, I went to a similar resort just to check it out. And it was gross. Like, you know, and it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just wealthy white um, um, uh, French tourists, you know, lounging on the beach, being served by, by, by black waiters. It was also w very wealthy black Senegalese <laughs> being served by um, very poor black waiters. Um, and I would argue that a lot of the nonprofit index industry comes in with these very Western values. I mean, I'm going to touch on one that's very, very touchy, issues of LGBTQ, you know, like Soros Foundation going in to a Muslim country, Kyrgyzstan, and say, you need to, you need, or the UN going in and saying, you need to address this issue. I mean, look, I, I'm on your side on this one, whoever, you know, the UN is on this one, but that's colonialism at some level, and we should call it for what it is. Um, and I think that a lot of what's going on in, um, in these countries is really, really bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm a believer in trying my best to present the way people live without making a judgment about it um, and saying, this is how it is. I don't know if they should change or not, but this is how it is. And um, letting other people decide. I mean, I, I find one of my, my pet peeve with, with travel is people come in and start complaining about the local culture. Like you're a guest. <laughs> this, you know, they, you're, this is you should you should be respectful of the culture you're in. Let me ask like a follow up question here. I'm sorry for the rant. <laughs> um, because about the knowers and the known, because I think that is really an interesting. There's an interesting asymmetry here, partly because of the way in which the, um, let's say, um, like in some sense the the cultural and community conditions that you're sort of praising are also like held in place to some degree by poverty and, ins and insularity. And so like one question is, suppose that people from all the places you've been to, suppose they could travel just the way that you do, right? So just suppose that they had the, the means and to travel in the way that you do. I mean, walking through various cities, you know, American cities, European, whatever, right? And, and, and suppose that they could do that and it was fully funded and stuff, right? And as many of them as wanted could do it. Do you think that their cultures would get worse? Do you think that would be bad for them? Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I, I don't know if you read my Senegal, Senegal piece. Yes. But I the one where you press, they press the button. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. But that's a question about whether you move to another culture. Right. right? Maybe you should say that. Sorry. For... So one of the things I wrote about Senegal was I, say, I said... I generally advocate when people come up, a young Vietnamese comes up to me and says, you know, I want to go to, I want to go to the U.S. I generally don't give them advice because I don't think it's, it's my position to give them advice. I don't know, but also I don't have a strong view. I think they have it better than they realize they have it because I don't think they understand what America is fully. Um, Senegal was the first country where if somebody came up to me, I said, get the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> like, press that. I said, if you could press a button to come to the U.S., come to the U.S. Um, there's a certain level of wealth by which when you fall below, like, I don't care how much community you have. You don't have the basics of life to live a healthy, full, vibrant life. Um, so that was what, what I thought 
that was my so but i wasn't so i wasn't i wanted to clear i just want people to get yeah, what we were yeah. talking about there but but i wasn't saying you know the people from mongolia i'm not saying mongolia people move here i'm saying people from mongolia get to so walk across water. new york city walk across paris walk across japan and then go back home it would um, change who they are yeah what would, would it what i what what specifically i want to know is would it undermine precisely what you see as valuable about those places? Because if it would, then I think there really is this question about these like cultures that must always remain known and never get to be knowers. I'm thinking about that. That's, that's deep. <laughs> um, they have to be kept in their ignorance in um, order to preserve this valuable thing. It's like they have to believe the myth or the noble lie or something. I, right? think, I think there's some of that there, yes. I mean, and, and that's kind of why I was asking you about the noble lie in some senses. Is, uh, but I think, um, I think that process is impossible given the, the world now. Sure. I think, I think you know, the, um, and I, I, don't I don't think you should ever preserve a place because it's, you know, because it's, it's cute to me. <laughs> I think that's offensive as hell, <laughs> you know. Like the idea that we should preserve Mongolia or preserve Vietnam, but I think there are, there are places that are going through certain stages of development where I've noticed that there's a certain stage where things are working out really well and people seem more content than not, and other stages don't seem that way. Like I think the perfect stage seems to be early development. Mm. You know, it's kind of what I think India is going through now. You know, I, I haven't been to India in 35 years, so I, I probably shouldn't reference that. Um, but um, Indonesia, um, you know, uh, Korea, Korea seems to have gone a little bit too far and, you know, where it's reaching the, like, I got a lot of wealth now what I do stage. Um, yes, in the green shirt. Yeah. Um, I guess my question for you is, like, when you're going to especially these foreign countries, there's this huge question, like, how do you, you're only talking to the people who speak English. And that's a very limited, that can be a very limited section of the population. Now you've talked, to, you've mentioned a couple of times where you spoke to someone and you commented on their amazing English, but you couldn't talk to someone and comment on their lack of English because you couldn't speak to them. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I think there's only so much you can do when you don't know the language. Um, and, um, but I do, I do, I will say that the amount of the people who know English is, is, is surprising, and, it, 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 and it's not necessarily just clustered. Um, I, was, I, was, I was really surprised to find out how many people spoke English in the GER district. Um, and part of that was, when I, when I commented to somebody, a Mongolian, about that, they said, well, yeah, there's a lot of missionaries up there. So, um, you know, there was this kid I thought I could impress, you know, I thought he, the other thing I learned is I'm really bad at basketball. I hate basketball. I suck at basketball. <laughs> And I, I naively thought, like, I saw this hoop in the middle of this Mongolian gear, and I thought I could impress these kids by shooting basketball. Mongolians are really good at basketball, by the way. Like, it's like their second national sport. So don't, like, it was embarrassing. Some kids crushed me in basketball, but um, they all, they spoke English. And, they, and these are like seven-year-old kids, you know. Not great English, but they spoke English. But it's a limiting factor. And, but I think this, it, it's more widely distributed than you realize because, again, English has become a global language. There's a really nice observation that you have in one of your blog posts about how when you're speaking to somebody and that person is not speaking their native language, they have to be more blunt. So that there's kind of subtleties and politenesses that we know how to do in our native language, but you just kind of say the words. Uh, you, about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, so, so there, there might be certain sorts of advantages, actually. Um, also, by the way, if you, if you do travel, get Google Translate, the app. Um, seriously, like people use it. People use it all the time. They'll just talk to their phone and point. You'll have conversations where people talk into their phone and just go like that. Um, we're, we're actually not that very far from having like that thing in Hitchhiker's Guide where you put it in your ear. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's seriously. It's, the other amazing thing you should, if you do travel, the other tip is Google app, the Google translation app. You can take a picture of the sign and it immediately translates it. Menus, things like that. Um, I have a question just because I moved every three years to like a different place and I was wondering how much um, you think community is attached to like where the place is because I think you talked about creating like a sense of place and community 
regarding that. And if you've seen throughout your tra travels, like your sense of place being eroded over time, or whether you've seen it happen in the communities you went to, it's definitely being eroded over time. I mean, I mean. Um, do you mean Chris's own sense, or do you mean at, in the places he goes to? Both. Oh. Um, I mean, I've never had a sense of place. I mean, it's I, I'm I'm very much the person I you know I talk about the intellectual. I'm very much a front row person. Um, I've never had a sense of place. I mean, a minor one, but we where, where I grew up, we were like, um, my dad was a sole professor in a town where there was no professors. Um, so we were the outsiders. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I went through all the local institutions. So I kind of developed that sense of place, but I always knew I was gonna get the fuck out of there. Um, so I'm not a very good, you know, one of the things I write about in my book is, um, I, at the end of my the end of the chapter of my book, I go back to my hometown, um, and I realize like it's still not for me, man. Like, um, but there was this there was this guy I worked with on, on a paint crew. His name was Stefan Stefan Cheatham, and um, like I was walking through um, this black neighborhood in my hometown. My hometown is it's like you know three thousand people. So um, where is this? Uh, it's Dade City, Florida. Okay. So. Um, I'm walking on, I was going to go check out, uh, you know, this whole neighborhood. And this guy sees me in the porch. He yells at me, yo, what are you doing here? Like, you know, um, and I just, I don't know why I said it. I said, oh, I'm looking for Stefan Cheatham. Like, I haven't seen Stefan Cheatham in 35 years. You know, we, 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 were, we, were, we, we worked together on a crew when I was 17. And here I was at the age of 50. And he goes, oh, Stefan, he's down that way. He's down, you know, you know down, he's down, down that, that street. He, he, his people are down, you know, just turn, and I, within five minutes, I was talking on the phone to Stefan Cheatham, and I realized I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> but, like, there are, some, there are still immense senses of places of people. You know, there's still a lot of America does not move. Um, and, and, like, you know, the, the idea of moving is just like, no. Um, but I do think that that's changing. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of um, incentives for it to change, um, you know, nature of work. Yes. I have uh, one question it's now. <laughs> At first when I got here I didn't have any, but now I have a lot. Um, I'll let you pick your favorite. Uh, well, first, do you have kids? I have three kids. Okay. Um, the first question is, uh, what's kind of fascinating, are they small kids? Uh, they're, they're basically your guys' oh, ages. Okay. Um, were you doing when they're little? No. Oh. I mean, we traveled as a, as a family together, okay. and we traveled kind of not too differently, <laughs> somewhat differently, but I, they, they didn't take to my type of travel. Oh, okay. I was going to ask if they were little that they had any fascinating questions, because uh, kids, they have an open mind. And, okay. um, so what, a, what I do have right now, um, I usually travel extraordinarily like I have a backpack a book bag like about the size of you know a knapsack that I, I that's all I bring but now I have a duffel bag full of Japanese collectibles I'm bringing back for one of my kids who uh who collects uh Sylvanian families I don't know if anybody knows what Sylvanian families are these are these little bunnies who dress up and <laughs> so they, in that sense they take interest in my travel The people, the people who've known me for most of my life see my finance stage as the weird stage. That was the one that, that they couldn't understand. This is more who I was as a child. Mm. That's okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and uh, why, why do you think you're not you're popular like, uh, in society? Like, Sorry? Why, why, aren't, why aren't you like the weirdo, the popular ones? This is something that I've always thought about. Like, why aren't like, the ones that are doing extraordinary things the popular ones, like in society, like instead of like the Kardashians and stuff like this, why, why is it? Um, I think, um, again, I, I started from, from the very beginning is I think the intellectual pursuit, as much as I love it, is a very weird niche thing. I think most people don't, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> you may disagree, I don't think most people spend their time reading philosophy thinking about the world. I just don't think they do. I think most people are content to just live a life. And I think, um, you know, 
I would never dissuade anybody from being an intellectual, but it's just not normal. But to me, like um, outside view, that what you're doing is uh, insulting. I mean, it, yeah, it is, and that's why it is, I, uh, what I'm saying is that doesn't have a mass appeal. And it's a mass appeal because I don't think most people, you know, most people are not drawn to questioning, like, why we're here, what we're doing. And in some senses, that's a successful culture, <laughs> that you're not, ha you're not doing that. Thank you. Um, since we're on the topic of you being the, on the position of a knower, and sometimes when you come across YouTube videos of people traveling, they seem to be a very particular demographic. Um, so I'm wondering, like obviously you, you have a gift, you're a very charismatic person. On top of that, you're, um, so like to, to be very blunt, a white man. So how much of the positive experiences while traveling or the things that you, you have learned about other cultures is enabled by travel intrinsically versus how people treat you because of your position as a I mean, I think knower there, and a traveler. I mean, I think there's a huge advantage. Um, I, mean, I think the gender is a huge advantage from, from a safety issue, from safety issue alone. Um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes what I'll try to do when I'm in a place is find another person to walk with, another outsider. Um, when I was in Amman, it was a Western woman um, and uh, I wanted to see the reaction, you know, a lot of people were like, well, you're going to be treated very differently as a woman going up into the hills, <laughs> you know, um, but we were treated the same as a, when we were together than as I was. As, as I, in fact, she, in some senses, more respectfully. Um, but I think, I mean, you can't, like, it, it comes with a, again, going back to the bias thing, like, you know, um, never always know who your narrator is <laughs> on any book you read, on any study you read, especially if you're doing this. Uh, because, and so I, I don't try to write about myself a lot because one of the things I find very frustrating is travel writers who centralize their own. So I have a real problem with Anthony Bourdain in the sense that he's, 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 he's the character. He goes out here, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. I mean, I try not to put myself, only, only recently have I started putting a few myself in some of the pictures, but only because people have asked for it, you know, to show. But I, I try not to have that picture of me with the locals, like, you know, because that's just, that, that comes with so many problems. <laughs> but I, I, I try to submerge myself to a certain degree, but that's also wrong to do because I'm not, you need to know who I am if you can trust me, you know. You need to know who the narrator is so you can know they can trust them. Um, yes. Yes, you. Yes. Um, okay, so at the beginning we talked a lot about the need for identity and belonging in the community. Um, but at the same time, different bubbles, bubbles exist where people can exist authentically uh, and have a sense of belonging, even though uh, those roles in that bubble may not exist in other bubbles. So you can think in one country there's like seven bubbles, in another country, there are seven different bubbles. At least that's what I was thinking about. So, uh, given that different bubbles exist and people can be uh, part of each authentically, I feel like societies that can accommodate different types of bubbles uh, and allow people to be freely between bubbles should naturally be like uh, better in some sense or more resilient, since they can accommodate uh, many different beliefs and many authentic. And so in my mind, this is like a liberal society. society. But um, I get your argument that there's this paradox where these are also monotonous cultures and that the ability to move between bubbles means that people lose a sense of meaning and identity and they don't really fully uh, fit in or have an authentic self anywhere. But that still feels kind of wrong to me. Um, and I think that people should be allowed to leave bubbles, which I don't think always happens in sometimes illiberal societies. So there can be like moral shunning or intolerance of outsiders, um, or people who are insiders but then leave and become outsiders. And so I was basically curious about how you think through these two ideas, um, being tolerating other bubbles but weakening the sense of I mean, um, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, I will say that um, 
I, I just kind of, I, it's something I've been thinking about and I haven't really written about much. Is, I mean, Japan is, part of, part of Japan's, um, I, I was reacting recently to an article that said um, Japan is, look at Japan as welcoming in lots of immigrants. It's not welcoming in lots of immigrants. Japan is not welcoming in lots of, Japan is very much a very um, non-diverse from a racial perspective. And cultural perspective place. doesn't mean that there's not a lot of different characters in Japan. doesn't mean that Japanese aren't filled with lots of creativity. So Japan has a uniformity of culture. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people who love, there are a lot of kind of liberals, neoliberals, um, kind of globalists, who move to Japan because they love it because it's safe and it's clean. And yet they never ask themselves, maybe, Japan is an immensely high trust society, absolutely high trust society. You, you can leave, I can leave you know, my bag <laughs> and then walk, and which I often did, you know, walk away for 20 minutes, come back, my bag's still there. Like, people don't steal. You, you know, so much of the whole system is built on trust. You go on, you know, you go on um, railroads, you go in this, it's almost all trust-based system. You can, you can easily not pay, but nobody doesn't not pay. Um, I think that high trust has something to do with the uniformity of culture. And I think it's, it's, it's the wrong thing not to ask that question, even though you may not want to come to that conclusion, even though you may not agree with that, rather than claim, oh, Japan is actually diverse, <laughs> which is what a lot of people, academics are doing. Um, I think, that goes back to someone asked earlier about it's easier to build a sense of nationalism um, <clears throat> if you have a kind of uniformity of culture, if you have one bubble, right? So to me, the big problem is not so much how many bubbles you have or if you have one or two bubbles. It's if your elites, are, your elites, your, the people who run the country are in a very different bubble than the, 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 the majority of people. So I think that's the case in the U.S. I think... Has it ever not been the case anywhere? No, I, I, think, I don't think it's the case in Japan. I actually think that there's a... You know, I, think, I think they share at a deep level, at a meaningful level, the same sense of place, the same mm -hmm. sense of meaning, identity. I think... Um, I think... Um, I think... In it, what you're seeing in Turkey is... what what is being cast in the West as this evil takeover by Erdogan is actually a return of a leader who shares the meaningful values of the people. So Erdogan is actually an Islamist. The vast majority of Turks are Islamist. Turkey has been run by secularists, elite secularists, for up for 45, 60 years. And Erdogan is a return back to an Islamist running the country. Mm. So that, they're now in sync. And um, the West doesn't like that for a variety of reasons. Um, but I think there are cases where the, the ruling class actually, I, I do these book readings of, 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 um, of uh, great books through Xena. Oh, so cool. I do like one a semester. I read Machiavelli um, the last night. I hated him. <laughs> I, I I just missed him. I said it, it's like if it's like it's like a version of Colin Powell, uh, airport book saying you know the, the things I learned as an insider. Mm -hmm. In any case, but he had one insight that was really important. Mm -hmm. He said, "The rulers can't fake being pious." Mm -hmm. He said, "You've got to have you have to have rulers who who share the values of the of, of the polis." And what is really detrimental, what kills them is if, it's, if they're hypocritical. Because then people can see through it. And I think that's to some degree what we have in the U.S. where a lot of people sense that the ruling class is, is hypocritical. Um, it doesn't, doesn't sh not only doesn't share their values, but doesn't, have, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't live up to the values they profess. I mean, to some extent, right? If they really just don't share the values, it, then... Like, if the rulers of Turkey are just secularists, then they're not going to be fake pious. 
Correct. Right. So and so they, they, they won't even be faking yeah. it. So he's saying that the, the absolute worst of the, of the rankings, the worst is fake bias. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So that's, so, that's even worse than not sharing their values at all. That's right. Exactly. And I agree with him on that one. But going back to your question, um, is he still there? Yeah. Yes. Going mm -hmm. back to your question is I, I don't have an answer to that one. I, it makes me uncomfortable to say that some of my evidence <laughs> is that in some senses, um, multicultural societies don't necessarily work that well and face more problems. And I, I, I go back to the US, which is a one that is working in some ways, in the sense that we, because we're, we're working on basically, we share kind of what I call the American dream or prosperity gospel. Like we're united in this goal. <laughs> Um, I happen to be very pro-immigration, so I don't want to like, you know, but I will say that, you know, you have to look at Japan and ask, hey, <laughs> so maybe it's working. Yeah. Hello. I was wondering what you primarily hope to accomplish with your body of work and blog posts, like what the goals are in letting other people see your experiences. Um, you know, I don't know that. I don't have that question. I mean, it's, it's my selfish answer is I really just here to learn. And, you know, one of the things I said to you before was uh, I, I don't necessarily have a philosophical mind. Uh, I, I find it very frustrating to re read through philosophical texts. Um, I, I find it um, kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm certainly certain fields. I'm, I kind of would like other people to complete the project <laughs> to take this information and say, here, here, let me build, let me build a grand unified theory of the world based on that. Um, because it's just not really in my skill set. You're um, generating data. Yes, yes. But um, some level is just intellectual curiosity. Can we, he, he, you wanted to ask a question, right? Oh, please. Remember, you, were you the one uh, who yeah, that we were talking about? Uh, I think you addressed it a little bit. Um, you were talking about like the, um, like what religion means for people and how like uh, you can have, there's a part of that's just like a kind of humility um, uh, that's important. Um, but you were, you were asking about the Big Bang, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you said that um, you, you started out interested in like the really big questions and, um, and uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'd ask you like if you, what you thought about God, if you believed in God and what, what you thought the nature of God was. And you were saying that God is, some, is like, um, uh, that, that there's this, like you were saying before, that like there's some things that we can never know, no matter what, like we ever do, like the human, like we can't expect human brains to collectively arrive at certain knowledge ever at all, and that God has something to do with that. It's like okay. on impenetrable uh, thing that uh, that there that we'll, no matter how much we know, there will always be more that we might not know, and we can't know how much we don't know, etc. Like that, and. I mean I guess I, I guess I picked on you only because I wanted to say that uh, the Big Bang is lacking. <laughs> it's just God dressed up in, in, in mathematical metaphors. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that you uh, mentioned uh, uh, McDonald's and mosques as uh, surprisingly uh, surprisingly strong centers of community. Um, what are what has been your experience with public libraries around the world? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they serve a similar role, but um, certainly in the U.S. they do. Um, but um, they come a little bit with that scoldy side. You have um, to be quiet often. Um, yeah. I mean, I, and, you know, and the thing is, is, um, you know, I think, I think they've been, they, they end up kind of, I don't think, you know, I don't mean it. I'm not, I'm not just saying that a lot of homeless people don't like reading because I've met some who are remarkable readers. Um, it's just that it's not their natural environment necessarily. And so it's, it just doesn't feel the same. Um, but I mean, they, they use them a lot for the same, for the same purposes, especially for the you know, char charging outlets, um, Wi-Fi, um, bathrooms. Well, one of the things that, you know, I had suggested back in my McDonald's phase that one of the things, you know, people used to say, like, one of the things I used to do, the way, you know, people do is how do you help? The way I used to help people was letting them work, working on my computer, working through bureaucracy with them. Um, so I'd sit at my, 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 I open up my computer and people ultimately would be, I'd basically be a social worker in the sense of like, you know, 
if you've ever worked through paperwork with detox centers and things like that, it's hell. Um, so just basically having online access and then helping them look up things, you know, on the internet and stuff like that. And I think I made some observation about that. And then someone said, oh, they're starting a policy of these, these uh, basically social service night, like every Thursday at this certain McDonald's. Cool. So. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing I've become curious about is sort of your views on education. Like, do you think that, like, it helps, like, liberal education, for example? Do you think it helps society and helps culture in the sense that, like, you know, maybe it, like, teaches us, like, you need to Do you think it actually hurts culture if, like, you think that, like, richer societies, like, somehow have worse culture? Do you think education could be a part of that? Do you think it just doesn't matter because most people don't actually care about this stuff? Like, I guess, what would you uh, I'm going with three. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, talk about provocative questions. Um, um, again, I, I, I would always argue, I, I always tell people to try to read as much as possible. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot more cool stuff in history than there is. And my, my, my frustration was, um, this is going to sound like a strange answer to your question, but my kids used to, I don't know, they're probably your age. Um, do you remember this damn sh show called, um, there was this cartoon um, about dinosaurs. What was it called? What? No, but it was it was like set, land, not land. Land before time. time. Is that like there's seven videos of land? Yeah, before yeah, time? yeah. It's like a million. Yeah. Yeah, and my kids used to watch it, and like, why are they calling them long necks? Why are they making up all these like <laughs> names for these things? Like, why? I mean, like, I felt that way about Game of Thrones as well. Like, like. Medieval period is much more interesting on itself. You don't have to make up <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> like, you know, so I think there's a lot of interesting things out there, like, you know, that people should, you know, I think there's, a, I think you can, make, you don't need Marvel movies because there's a lot of interesting reality-based stuff. But also I understand why people like Marvel movies. But, um, I mean, I, you know, I'm not so sure I would tell somebody to go into a great books program, you know, unless they had an inclination towards it um, because I mean you either know you want to do it or you don't I think was that fair or not do you think so uh, I think that I think in general you can almost never tell anyone what to do it will right. half the time backfire so you're on net doing nothing um, but I guess I think that there are things of incredible value that are where the value of those things is not immediately available and accessible equally to everyone. And yeah, if you can see those things, it's your job to try to make them visible to more people. And that's a good answer. She, she wins. <laughs> yeah, in the back there. Uh, yes, you who just turned around. Yes, you. <laughs> Oh, wait, you already asked the question. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> I'm only going to take questions from people who haven't asked questions. Um, yes, go ahead. So obviously it's super cool that you can do everything that you can do as someone who has a job and family and a kid and a wife and the whole thing in 15, you know, 15 days of PTO, I can't exactly you know, go to Taiwan for a month or whatever, as much as I would love to, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So with those sort of constraints of the modern world as much of a framework as that actually is, like what do you think is a reasonable sort of middle ground, middle point to say like, hey, fly to a country for a week and, you know, how would you sort of navigate those certain constraints? Certain right. I mean, I think my, if I had to, like, where do you want to go? Just give me an example. I'll go to Indonesia. Indonesia. Um, <clears throat> don't go to Bali. I know you don't want to do advice, but it's like, no, no, no. no, 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 no I'm, I'm just, I'm just working, I'm working through this. Yeah, yeah. So my advice to someone like you is, you know, don't go to Bali. Like, everybody goes to Bali. Yeah. Um, you know, but then again, like, I ask you, do you want, do you like beaches? Do you like, you know, but if you want to see, I mean, Bali is not Indonesia, not anymore. Um, when you go to Jakarta, people would ask me, why are you here? I'm like, you know, what do you mean? It's like, why aren't you in Bali? <laughs> like everybody who comes here goes to Bali. It's like, I've never been to Bali. I don't want to go to Bali. Um, you know, um, even better, Jakarta. Get, go to the, I sometimes go to the second biggest city, um, you know. Um, 
I, um, you know, I can I can look at a map and say I go I go, I don't do this anymore, but I used to go because I don't even need to. Is like Google, you know, Jakarta things to do. Top ten. I don't do any of them. <laughs> you know, like just boom. I don't need to do that now. Um, that's a little harsh. Sometimes there's one, you know, I'm like, um, but I just kind of walk around, re really, and um, you know, just try to get, just try to be kind of, just walk around and see the place and get a sense for what it's like. Now that's my type of, tra that's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. You know, I, one of the pieces I wrote about Istanbul is telling people not to go to Hagia Sophia, and everybody got mad at me. And I, you know, I wrote back saying, well, Wait, you know, yes or no? I said, don't go to the Hagia no, Sophia. No. But then, you know. You know, um, I now say to people, check, go quickly check it off. You know, you say you've seen the Hagia Sophia, um, and then go to the Asia side, go to the less visited parts. Go to less, you know, don't go to the places most people tell you to go. That's basically the quick advice. Yeah. So when you are traveling, is it like a unique way for you to keep track of all the places, or like the memories you have? Um, I take photos. I'm a photographer. Um, so I take immense amounts of photos. And so, um, and then my, my writings, I, I generally write a piece every 10 days with a lot of photos. So the photos I found are a very good way of taking notes effectively. I can just take a picture of something and it brings back the memories of that and that basically is my notepad. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't hear the very, very last bit. Like, in, in what way does something do, like, uh... I mean, that's like, oh, man. <laughs> I wish I could answer that question. Um, you, like, I mean, how does history change, you know? I mean, it's like, um, like, one of the guys I like, his, his, my, my theory used to be, it's, you know, it's, it's basically, and to some degree, Machiavelli, who I hate, agrees, is, um, it's a, a bit basically when, when the ruler becomes corrupt, people toss them out. Um, but there's this guy, I forget his name, who I was reading, who says basically change only comes from inter-elite competition, meaning that, um, that everything is basically just two factions within elites. You know? That's certainly like if you look at the Russian Revolution, that was a Russian Revolution, right? It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. wasn't led by the proletariat. It was led by a bunch of activists over in Geneva, you know, who who got lucky. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think I've become more and more convinced that kind of how how these things happen, revolutions happen, in some senses, is, is basically all driven by elites. Can you talk a little louder? Yeah. In, in what way does like a change like dictate or create in culture? Which way does that what? Like, uh, Which way does it? How does a change either thicken or make thinner? A so culture? one of the things I wrote recently is um, one of the dangers is I think it's to build a high trust functional society takes a long time, but it can it can fall apart very quickly, and you and I think the line I said is you can't legislate back meaning. Like once, once you kind of break that level of a culture, it's very, very, very hard to build it back. And so that's really, a, you know, that's a, that's a big problem. When you have a culture that's working um, or a society that's working, it's, it's, it's so, it's so, when it breaks, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to bring, build it back again without dramatic change. Okay, last question. Yes, you get the last question. So you mentioned earlier something about multicultural societies and that, in your opinion, the evidence showing that they seem to not always work out. It seems like a lot of these places you visited are singular culture societies that work. And then you mentioned that the U.S. is kind of like a multicultural society that kind of works but kind of doesn't. 
Could you talk a little more about that and the evidence you've seen of different like multicultural societies and what leads you to believe that? Um, I mean, you know, Korea, Taiwan, um, Indonesia, uh, Japan are places. I mean, they, Indonesia has does have you know a more diverse mix, um, um, but in general, kind of places with um, you know the the problem. I mean, to put it in really gross terms, um, you need a minority group that's not big enough to cause problems, and then you can just basically stiff arm them and ignore them. I mean, that's really, I, I don't act, I don't, I'm not, I'm not pro <laughs> that, <laughs> but unfortunately that's what happens is you get, when the minority group is two to 3%, they can be ignored um, and um, in some senses uh, completely dismissed. Um, and um, so, I mean, I, I think when you're doing these kind of world building games, you just, just, the ethical issues are so, <laughs> so fraught that it's very dangerous to talk about them even or to think but but i think you know it's worth thinking about but um you know i i i do think that the west needs to think about more openly honestly why japan works it, why it, and in some level japan doesn't work because japan is having declining birth rates korea's having declining birth rates taiwan's having declining birth rates so there's a problem there so, you know, but in terms of things like public order and the things like um, cleanliness and, cl and crime and deviance, they, they have less of a problem. Um, and I, I certainly think some of that comes from the uniformity of the culture. I mean, that may, that may not be worth, you know, versus the ethical issues, but I think it's worth, worth noting. Okay, um, let's thank Chris.